Right, and we're back in the room. Welcome back, friend. This is a cracking chat, this. I'm loving this. He's a fascinating man, isn't he? So many strings to the bar. I'm just going to wait to see Will pop up. Hey, welcome back, Terry. I'm just going to wait to see when I see Will Will's uh, request in the stream. Then we'll carry on with this. Here we go. Boom, 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 boom. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the uh, Danny Buckler Show. Tonight's special guest, Mr. Ramblin' Will Hodgson. Here we are. There you go. You're back. <laughs> You're back. Just give it a bit of a gesture and there you are. <laughs> cool. Can you hear me all right, Will? Sorry, mate. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, just a bait. My, my phone is absolute, like... <clears throat> I don't know whether it's a bad phone or whether it's just that it gets, like... Um, it gets... I'll take it into the Genius Bar sometimes, get it cleaned out. And I remember the last time I went in and the girl took it out of the back and she was like, she was like oh, quite, that was very cathartic. So thank you for that. And it was like a load of like, pocket lint, like the size of a man's fist in the phone. So it's probably something to do with that. I've not got a cover on it but i'm just i'm I'm just not very sort of good with technology mate I'm, it's a nightmare to me i'm awful with it we've all had to go we've all had to do this now though because this is this is basically the circuit now this is it yeah i don't mind it that much to be honest with you because i, I think this could be this could be the making of it in some ways and obviously our live audience is, is ideal and everything but i think this is this whole thing of um doing stuff or not, I think it's much but it's been a few it's been a few sort of like knockers, haven't there, on like comedians Facebook and stuff of the whole concept of it. People going sort of like, oh you wouldn't catch me doing that. But I think it's a good thing. I do too. And it's always the ones but whenever you see someone knocking anything, you need to have a look at what they're doing. Well exactly it's easy it's easy to knock stuff, but it's the Yeah. It, it's the it's the time for inventiveness. You gotta you gotta be a bit Conor MacGyver with this situation. Absolutely. Like, you've got to you work know, with, just yeah, that. with what you got. Because it's like, you know, if I don't do this, what am I doing all day? Well, exactly. And you've done that. You did that show, that that fantastic show. The Oh, thank you. Um, what about <coughs> your your kind of brushes with London's underworld and stuff, and the, and the Parker Penn story, which is like with the Fountain Pen story, which is like one of my favourite anecdotes I've ever heard. Yeah, <laughs> the Parker Pen thing. It's just like that should have been the first scene in Legend. Yes, that would have been incredible, actually. Yeah, that should have been the that picture of the guys that are fucking. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, Rod. Fuck you. That's just. Have you seen those? Um, there's another one of those. They were the Rival Cray films. Oh, the budget ones. Yeah, Rise, Rise of the Cray. And... There's a third one now that is just solely focusing on. The Mad Axeman. My um, my uh, granny's cousin was the when he said oh, they showed that photo of Frank Mitchell chained to a prison guard. That prison guard was related to my granny. Oh right. That he's chained to, and the uh, Frank Mitchell they used to call the Mad Axeman. He um, was like <clears throat> he was a very kind of um, um, he possibly had like learning difficulties i think or something like he like, did yeah very kind of like at a low mental age but this guy was called norman he was my granny's cousin and he was like he was quite badly um maimed by um him being hugged by frank mitchell frank mitchell just went up to him one day and he was sort of like oh norman i love you you're not so bad and hugged him and it broke all of his ribs oh jesus his vertebrae in his back and he was never quite the same again it was a bit like um you know in the bugs bunny cartoons with that big abominable snowman they look all right bunny wabbit of my very own i sure love him and yeah, he kiss him and yeah. he basically used to do that with prison guards and like seriously in seriously injure him, but he said they used to. So he's um, told me that he used to um, be out in the. He used to be in the workshop. They'd make chest expanders, ball workers, and Mitchell would just rip them to pieces as part of his daily exercise. And when it was the winter, it was snowing, and he'd be out there shirtless, working out on the moors, doing his work shirtless. And there was um, I don't know, I can't remember whether it was I read it from him or whether I read it somewhere else, but he was shagging a primary school teacher that lived in like a nearby village and they just used to let him crack on with it because it kept him mm. 
it came on a dose of, but he was mostly like, although he'd like sort of hug people to death, he was seemed to be mostly. And then of course they sprung him, didn't they? And then didn't know what to, to like <laughs> set him on Mad Frankie Fraser. I think it was one of like, the day they sprung him. Mad Frankie got banged up for twenty years, and they were stuck with a enraged Mad Axman yeah. in, in the. They had him in a camp, they had him in a flat in Bethnal Green, and they were bringing him like prostitutes and stuff. That he wasn't allowed out because he'd be seen walking about. So they were bringing him prostitutes and stuff. Yeah, and he was burning, for just getting bored and stir crazy after a week, and going for like a wander around. Get back in that because he was like, up there. It was easy to spot wandering around. It's a good concept for a film, but I, I fear it's poorly executed. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine. God, I watched the that Rise of the Foot Soldier thing. Those blokes who got shot in that Range Rover, I reckon have had more films made about them than Winston Churchill. Mm. And it's just, you know, they're just, it's basically just, they, they, they were just four nightclub banks who did a bit of dealing. Yeah, four they morons. They were elevated to like, sort of born supremacy levels. Uh, there's like the Pat Tate story. And I don't think any, if there was ever any suggestion, any of that happened from anything I've read about Pat Tate, about him chucking Sean Ryder off of a, Thing. And now there's like one where they're doing like a hoist in Marbella. I just, I, from what I understand, having read Coral and Leach's book before they turned it into a, like, um, into a, like, like a franchise, that it was just, it seems to me they were just like doing a bit, a, lot, a load of bullies who did a lot of coke and did a bit of dealing and obviously like come a cropper when someone, yeah, would come along. But Rise of the Foot Soldier is one of my sort of guilty pleasure films. That's one of the that's one of my favourite bad films. It is bloody awful, but it is satisfying. You're, you're the one who turned me on to We Still Kill the Old Way. <laughs> oh, Ian Ogilvy. Ian Ogilvy and Stephen Burkhoff. Ace. It's got Renton's dad out of train spotting. Yeah. <laughs> they, they still, there's another, there's another one, they still steal the old way. Is that the it's sequel? Like a sequel, they do like a hoist. They still kill the old way and also steal the old way. And I don't know what would the third one be in the trilogy. <laughs> we still double park the old way. <laughs> <laughs> the old way. There's some, but there's some belters of them sort of, them sort of films. Craig Fairbrass is the, he's kind of like the James Stewart of shitty director DVD gangster films. It, he is the iconic. He just, he has just got, he just exudes whatever it is that you have to exude to be in those sort of films. For, it, one, wasn't there some kind of thing where Craig Fairbrass wears a bullet round his neck that his dad got jammed in his teeth because Ronnie Craig tried to shoot him or something like that? Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a story about that. I don't know if it's true or not, but... There is yeah. some. See, it's, Sort of touches like that that elevate Fairbrass beyond the level of of things in in East EastEnders, like some fine work. Don't get me wrong, with Dan Sullivan, but as um, the whole Pat Tate thing has kind of come into it, so it's just really weird that you keep having to remind yourself this was an actual bloke. Yeah. But what does his like mum watch these things, <laughs> or or something or like people who knew him? They sort of like oh, it's like it's like Pat. It's like if. I don't know, like if sort of someone I used to score weed off of in the 90s died and then they made like a John Wick type film with like, <laughs> I don't know, Jean-Claude Van Damme playing it and showing him like fighting <laughs> Nick or something like that. would be like, I don't remember that happening. <laughs> I'm not scoring a eighth of Lebanese off of him at the railway tavern. I don't recall any ninjas. Or <laughs> I don't recall this <laughs> Especially like elevating your local drug dealer becomes an action hero. <laughs> that would be a cracking film, actually. I'd love to do a Chippenham heist movie or so. I'd like to, what I'd like to do is remake Roadhouse in Chippenham. That would be beautiful. Have you seen Fatal Deviation? See what? Fatal Deviation. No. Oh, get on that. It's on YouTube. Fatal Deviation. It's it's from nineteen ninety six. Where um, this 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 guy um oh. What's his name? My brother, if you're in this chat, let remind us. He was uh, trying to get a job as a stuntman in China, and it, you can only do that with film credits. So him and a couple of mates got this old VHS camera and made this Irish kung fu film. Jimmy Bennett, that's his name. Thank Fatal you. Fatal Deviation. Fatal Deviation. You, you will be well rewarded. 
how do I watch this? It's on YouTube. I'll send you a link to it. Brilliant. Please it's brilliant. Do. There's so much to dissect there, let me tell you. Fatal deviation. I'd have the... My brother showed it to me, and I mean, it, he, he saw it first, and he showed it to me, and I was just cracking through the whole thing. I'm going to watch that. And Shane from Boyzone, that's right, is yes, the, the from villain. Boyzone. Shane from Boyzone is the villain. <laughs> I would have thought McFadden out of Westlife was the one who had the... Does, am I remembering rightly that Brian McFadden out of Westlife squared up to all 21 or so solid crew at the Brit Awards one year? No, and I didn't he, hear that one. The only, but I think it was, he had some kind of square up with it. And then they all sat down. The, I can't even remember where I, where I heard or read this. Probably like in the paper. But they apparently all sat at their tables. And so solid crew was sat beyond Westlife. And apparently McFadden got like a magnum of champagne and launched it Begbie style over his shoulder and it went through the middle of the so solid crew table and they all got up and he was like sort of like come on and then Simon Cowell was apparently like sort of like what like, sit down Brian he's like, like slap sit down yes Simon and that was the end of it fucking but it's the fact he could have fucking it, it's I can see that that McFadden would have an edge that he'd be I don't say that he would he would have been beaten to death but I can imagine that he'd attempt to take on all 21 or so solid crew that is that's the film I want to see Brian McFadden versus So Solid Crew. <laughs> like a, John Wick in the yeah, right, pop world. That is a B picture. Brian McFadden versus So Solid, so solid Crew. I'd be like the... Um, you ever seen Black Six? No. Um, where there's the six guys from the... Um, basically, some rednecks kill an African-American kid, but they don't. what they haven't figured out on was that his brother is like a linebacker from the Chicago Bears, and there's like six other footballers who've all got fuck off Harley Davidsons, and they go down south and kick the living fuck out of all the racists. <laughs> Black six, they're all like, I mean, the credit's sort of like such and such, San Francisco 49ers. This would have been like, uh, sort of who fancies a bit of good, a bit of good old mindless entertainment? Who wants to see some football players you like kicking the shit out of the Ku Klux Klan? Of course. <laughs> The Black Six. <laughs> that one, you ever seen Black Gestapo? Oh. Another same sort of era, 70s black exploitation film. Tagline, the new master race. The Black the black Gestapo. So they're like the Gestapo, but it's whitey that they're, that they're <laughs> after. It's a Google it and just check the poster out. It's like a, got a guy, like a guy who looks a bit like Isaac Hayes with a you know, like what looks like a Gestapo uniform with like a black power fist on the on the hat do it, on the poster. It's quite a thing. It's, it's not a very good film, has to be said. But the concept is quite st- st- quite like that got that got like yeah, that got made. I'm a massive fan of Blackula. Blackula, because there was Scream, Blackula, Scream, Scream, Blackula, Scream. Yeah, the sequel. <laughs> Jekyll and Mr. Black. <laughs> Give him sass, he'll kick your ass. That was the tagline. <laughs> he'll kick your ass. What's the, good? What's the... You ever see the thing with two heads? Yeah, that's um, Ray Meland and... Um, who's the other guy? The other uh, head. Tagline is, they glued a white bigot's head to a soul brother. He, yes. <laughs> the, 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 the mob are after him. Oh. What have you? That's the. There's some. What was the. Um, well, not Kung Fu. Black Belt Jones. That was another good one. Mm. Black that, Belt. With, I think. Did that I, was Jim um, Kelly from uh, Enter the Dragon. I think it might have been, yeah. Black Belt Jones. And Cleopatra Jones in the Casino of Gold. Only man that Bruce Lee let choreograph his own fight scenes in a Bruce Lee film. Who did? Bruce Lee let Jim Kelly choreograph his own fight scenes. That's quite a compliment, paid for that. What did you think of a time in Hollywood? I loved it. I loved it as well. I thought we watched it twice. I thought it was ace. I I went in thinking like, oh, this will probably... I won't like this. I nearly didn't go and see it. It was my birthday, and I was sort of like, "Oh, if I must." And we we all come out we're like, "Yeah, fucking Cliff Booth, mate, fucking face." <laughs> we're absolutely. I've never been so buzzing. Yeah, after seen a film. We were just up. We were just up the old road after getting pissed and saying Cliff Booth a lot and imitating the 
fucking that you t- that was that you take that mechanical asshole out of the front of <laughs> well, front of it. <laughs> yeah, noisy hunk of shit. Oh, absolute. That's my favourite Brad Pitt role. Uh-huh. Aprio role. Boy, foot boy four. The Bruce Lee bits. Bruce Lee bits. Funny. I'm not saying. I don't think there's any. Such a, mind you, Burt Ward reckons that he in the when he was talking about when they did the Green Hornet Batman episode, kind of remembered it as Bruce Lee kind of like bullying him a little bit. Well, I had the other. I had read the, the way I read that story. In um, it was um, Burt Ward was giving it the, you know, um, I, I'm a black belt in karate around the set to try and impress the girls. Yeah, and I practiced karate and that, and then. When Bruce Lee was coming, because Adam Adam West was like you know partial to a wind up, he was um, sort of goading. But what oh, Bruce has heard what you've been saying, he's coming for you hard. You want to watch yourself here, and then so then Burt Ward spends a good couple of weeks shitting himself, but then when Bruce Lee turns up, Burt Ward locks himself in his trailer, won't come out, and Bruce Lee's outside giving it all the Aah! all this and kind of like square, you know, completely in on it, trying to create this sort of. Frightening Burt Ward, the whole God. crew cracking. There was the um, the the bit in um, with Vincent Price in the Batman sixty six series. So Burt Ward was pissing everyone off off on set by I don't know. I think he just he was just I think he just got give people the arsehole mm. from time to time, and they got um he was there was the egghead episode, and he'd said he didn't want to be hit with any eggs in the fight scene. And they got Vincent Price to smash three boxes. Over his head, in the in like the take that they they used, he was apparently Burt Ward was like roars a dog's knob about that. But you're not going to fight Vincent Price, black belt in karate or not. Vincent Price would intimidate you. Oh yeah, Blood. I was watching Theatre of Blood the other night. Oh, that don't age that film. They ought to do a, a remake of that up at the Fringe with all the critics in it. With like Copstick and Bruce Desso and all of that lot as the victims in it, and have someone like um, who'd be Vince, who'd be Lionheart though, who'd be the disgruntled, who'd feel John Robbins. Do you know what would be good? I'm not saying that he's like that he's like that rough, but PBH would be good in that in that <laughs> role. But I can, just, I can just imagine that as being like sort of Steve Bennett and all of that lot as the <laughs> the force-fed poodles. <laughs> up at the fridge, the um, courtyard of blood. Courtyard of blood. Courtyard of blood. Courtyard of Hogarth and, and blood. But Diana Rigg in the wig, trying to pretend she's his. <laughs> they got Diana Rigg in that wig and moustache, pretending she's a bloke for the whole film, and it's supposed to be a shock when she takes the wig off and goes, "Oh, that's right, it's me." She already appears without it. In, in like it's it's the it's totally. I love that film though. It is like it is like the best sixty six Batman episode that's not got Batman in it. Mm. I think it's got all the kind of tropes of that. Same as like, I always think that third episode of Sherlock is the best Batman Riddler film you're never gonna get. Which third episode of what? That episode of Sherlock with more the first one Moriarty in it, that great race one. That's the yeah, best yeah. that's the best Batman Riddler film you're never gonna get. Mm. That's what a Batman Riddler film should be like. It should be all... What they ought to do is they ought to do one Batman film that's like got like, the action and like the Batmobile and blowing shit up. They ought to do one that is the whole thing of Batman, the world's greatest detective, and have it all as like mind, all as, like, mind games. Well, that's what that's the, the rumour is. That's what this next Batman film's going to be, Will. Well, I, I fully welcome that. They're doing this... It's called The Batman. It's very low-key, and Paul Dano's playing the Riddler. Who's playing the Riddler? Paul Dano. Who's who is he? He, um, he plays the. Um, he's in Twelve Years a Slave. He's in Twelve Years a Slave. He plays the arsehole slave runner. Oh right. Who works for Benedict Cumberbatch? I thought they had Jonah Hill in mind for that. No, Jonah Hill was approached and uh, walked away. Jonah Hill would have been better as the Penguin, I think. Mm. No, we've got Colin Farrell as the Penguin. No. Yeah. I can't see Colin Farrell going whack, whack, whack. No, it's not going to be that iteration of the character, I'm sure. My gas umbrella. The giant flying umbrellas across the sky. 
they should do that just for the reaction of like dark age comic book fans. <laughs> oh, here we go, Colin. Here's a pink top hat, and then we're going to do a thing with you stealing the jeweled ostrich egg of <laughs> Rubovia or something like that. Because <laughs> my favourite um, line in the whole Batman oeuvre is Burgess Meredith with the, in the film. So, like, ah, how was I supposed to know he'd have a can of shock repellent bat spray? <laughs> Oh God! I love you. Were the one that um, the first one to tell me who was who was in the false face mask. Yeah, it was um, a guy called Malakoy Throne. But there were score coins. Uh, they um, he didn't like it, and he wanted his name taken off of it. So they put a question mark, like question mark as false face. And everyone thought like, oh, it's fucking Sammy Davis Junior. And or it's Milton Burl. Or whatever under the fall. It was just sort of just, what's his face, Malakoy thrown. I thought that was a fair enough episode. It's what they think they did that instead of Clayface. Because obviously, although Clayface bizarrely is in the title sequence of the series, there must have been some kind of like vague notion of having a Clayface episode. For them to have done a, when they do the pan in the title sequence, it pans. Oh, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll get knocked back. You can see Clayface yeah. in the third row, and there's King Cobra as well. There's like a few sort of generic bad guys, but there's um, there's Clayface. They must have had like a, some kind of idea of like, or just oh, sorry, that's my, that was my oh, it's just bung a load of mud on someone and just like get the shot before it all kind of slides off of him. I, I always like to think as well that um, RT out of Larry Sanders would have been in a 66 Batman episode, like in Universe, so the Rip Torn character. Mm. I like the idea that in Universe, he was like in a, in like one episode, as like a henchman or something like that. That would have been cool. I was always, brain. I was always sort of slightly, um, the, uh, the, the Lost Two-Face episode, I always fancied him, they did it as an animated film recently, but um, there was talk of Clint Eastwood playing Two-Face. Yeah. But um, those didn't like the character. Clint Eastwood, the idea was that he was going to be, rather than like a lawyer who had acid chucked in his face, it was going to be a TV presenter who had a camera blow up in his face, and not half of it was going to be... I wonder how they'd have done it. I think I read somewhere, some kind, it might have just been speculation, but that half of his face was going to be like makeup, like sort of great show marks, kind of angry mm. face. Makeup and the other half normal, but I can't see how that would. Uh, I reckon that's probably why it didn't happen in the end. Which is them thinking, how are we going to do horrendous acid scarring on a family TV show? Mm. Probably never had the scarecrow. Though. I remember I've got somewhere the they did a <clears throat> animated series that was kind of followed it up that had the scarecrow in it. It was like, it was kind of how they would have probably done the scarecrow in that thing. So it's he in the cartoon thing rather than being. Like the scarecrow who uses fear gas, he's like agriculture themed. So he's got like a tractor <laughs> and his hideouts are born and that kind of shit. So he's basically like a villainous words or gummage. So <laughs> that's what it would have been like. <laughs> like in that, it's just like he's got like fucking guys dressed in those like the Wurzels <laughs> as henchmen. It's like you can't have him like causing psychological horror. So it's like the scarecrow, well, just he's, he's going to be stealing the. Jeweled bale of hay from now. This the Batman '66 comic was really good. I thought that well, they did the they followed it all up in comic form a few years back, and they did like they did some that weren't even in the series. They did like Bane, but instead of being like a whatever the fuck Bane's meant to be, he was like yeah. a luchador wrestler in that in that one. And then there was they were they were going to do right a they. I saw the cover for it. They only did the cover. They were going to do a Batman 90, which was going to be carrying on from Batman Returns. With Billy D. Williams as Two-Face. Yes, that was on the cover, was Billy D. Williams as Two-Face. So it was going to carry on with that. They were going to totally fuck off Batman Forever and Batman and Robin and go on as if Tim Burton had done it. So the front cover was Billy D. Williams with the Two-Face thing. And for some reason, it never got made. So the cover is just there to taunt me. Online. It's like um, Burton's script for Batman Triumphant that never got made. The Batman? 
Batman Triumphant was going to be the sequel to Batman Returns. Yeah, that was going to be Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, Scarecrow. Scarecrow. Uh, Madonna as Harley Quinn. Nice. Bit of Um, trick about Batman films. The reason they didn't make one for years was because there was a clause written in that any Batman film had to be set in space. Are you serious? Yeah, seriously. There was, there was going to be one with God. They started. They wrote one that was going to be Batman and Godzilla, and that never got made. And then every time someone went to make one, they were like, "No, it says here in the thing it has to be," because it was supposed to be written in like with the moon landings in mind. They were like, "No, it has to be Batman in space or nothing." Because there was, I think there was a, there were plans to do a one that was similar to the Christopher Reeve Superman one, right? Um, that was going to have um, Silver St. Cloud as the love interest and the Joker and the Penguin as the bad guys. But I think there's, I think there's a script somewhere <clears throat> kicking about, but that never got, never got any, never got anywhere. But that was, that would be interesting. What kind of tux that would have been a bronze age film. That would have been pre dark Knight returns. Mm. And it'd be interesting to see what sort of tone and what sort of costume. I was always, um, there was talk of, um, when the Dark Knight Returns was uh, had been about out for about three years, so before Batman '89 got made, there was talk of a Dark Knight Returns film with Burt Lancaster playing the aging Batman. That's a good shout. Mm. I remember in the I think it was the Mirror when I was about eleven. I wish I'd, this is what I wish I kept out of any clock tabloid cutting. They were announcing plans for a gritty Doctor Who movie. This would have been like 1989. And they had Donald Sutherland tipped for it. And there was like a picture of Donald Sutherland's head grafted onto Sylvester McCoy. And it was like Doctor Who will be carrying a gun and he'll be doing sex scenes with assistants. <laughs> I, I just, I just all stuck in my head. It's like Donald Sutherland like, looking like a nutter. <laughs> of course, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be Doctor Who carrying a shooter. And all of that. I just wish I kept that. It's probably it must be online somewhere. <laughs> I don't know whether they. I think they just kind of well, thought, what can we fill like a page with here? Like, yeah, they're going to do like the gritty Batman remake. Got Zap Pow comics aren't just for kids anymore. We'll have um, yeah. Donald Sutherland with a gun. <laughs> I don't want to see Donald Sutherland as Doctor Who though. I was thinking of Donald Sutherland. I can't think of him without thinking of his of his posterior because of Animal House and um, Don't Look Now. Yeah. I was never thinking of Donald Sutherland without his, without his ass kind of like as an intrusive thought. I nearly knocked Donald Sutherland. Speaking of Donald Sutherland's ass, I once knocked him on it nearly. So you got what? I once nearly knocked Donald Sutherland on his ass. Did you? When I was working in Harrods. We had this in the toy department. I was doing the magic in the toy department. Yeah. And we had this um, this new type of skateboard where you stand on it and you sort of move your feet like that and it makes the skateboard go. And we were having a go on it. And I had my, I had my first go on it and it just shot across the shop floor. And I couldn't stop it. And I just went bang into a customer. And the pair of us went down. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. It was like an older guy. Donald Sutherland. And he sort of sprawled with his bag. And then he... He got up. He had like white short hair at the time and a bit of white beard on. <laughs> and just thought it was like it was no problem. It's no problem. He's laughing. It, it, I remember that kind of him just laughing and being really easy, and it was fine. He didn't even mention it to anyone. He was just smiling and happy. One off he went. Court, one Ashton Court festival. You know Ashton Court in Bristol, the music festival, the comedy tent. One year, I think it was about two thousand two. I reckon. I was back backstage, and me and um, Russ Howard and um, Ira Rainey were doing like a whole thing of like fucking about, like locking each other in the portaloo by shoving like a biro in the thing and like rattling it and that. And I went, I went to get some food. I come back, and there's Ira and Russell rattling the portaloo, and then they sort of see me, and they are like, "I thought you were in, the, you were in there." I think the place like quickly opened it. It was fucking Paul McGann. <laughs> you gotta come out of there, like, go out of there, like insert your own TARDIS joke. <laughs> right there. So, go out, I was all like, fuck me, it's it's I. <laughs> With the, <laughs> the good shaking. <laughs> Sorry, that's cracking. 
Bob <laughs> tipped Ken Loach once in a cinema. When I was about 16, I went to see a screening of one of his films. He was doing a QA, and and I've not ever seen him before. I bumped into him in, when I was going to get some popcorn or whatever, and I was sort of all kind of like surly, sort of sick to us, sort of like, oi, 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 fucking, like, sort of like, like, fucking easy, and all of that's fucking, and looks fucking Ken Loach, and obviously, yeah. That's the, Happy times. God, oh, cool. mate, the hour is late, I think, I think it's half a we don't have, we don't have an hour and a half, it's getting late now. I've had a great time though, mate, I've had do, a great do, Can you do, will you come back on again? Absolutely, mate, absolutely, I'd love to. Please, that'd be beautiful, I'd love that, yeah, definitely. I bloody love to, mate. I've had a great time. That's been good fun. Cheers, Will. Thanks for coming on. No worries. My pleasure, mate. My pleasure. You stay safe, man, yeah? You too, man. I love you, and I'll see you soon, I hope. Love you too, man. You take care, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Take care, Will. You too. Easy, mate. Good night, mate. Stay. Bye. Go. There you go. And that was... That was rambling Will Hodgson. Oh, he's one of the most fascinating people I know. He's, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg. He's got so many stories. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was good fun. Um, it was good fun, actually. Yeah, I, I had a really good time. Um, I'll leave this up in the IGTV if you want to see the rest of it. If you're just coming in now and you missed that. And um, yeah, I've got some more people coming up um, this week. I've got one more tomorrow night. I think Jack Carroll's going to be here. That's going to be good fun. And then uh, Saturday's um, going to be Saturday afternoon, early evening. It'll be Zen time with Buckles. If you want to come for one of those little um, spiritual chats that I do. If you don't, I don't mind. It's up to you. But it'll be there if you want it. And um, that's the story of me. Thank you very much for tuning in to this evening's Danny Buckler Show. And I will see you on the next one. Take care, friends. Stay safe. Good night.